Hey guys, my name is Jason with Mount Baker Mining and Metals, and we're back here at my new gold mine. Today this video is going to be a little bit different. I have a really good friend of mine. We went to school together. He's one of the best geos I know. Worked for big companies, done a lot of exploration work, and we're going to do a little geology lesson today on how gold veins form. But let me see if I can wave my arms here and show you some of the big structures we're going to be talking about today. Yeah. Well, let's see if this works here. This is the mountain face that holds three different vein structures, actually four, that we're gonna be talking about today off and on. But to get you oriented, here's our road going up to our blacksmith shop, is right over here. We go in about 600 feet through the mountain, hit the rays, go up the rays, connect through the transfer way, and then here is the stope that we're working in. These are the vent holes, this is where our escapeway is. This is vein number one. I'll reference this as vein number one, and we're working over here. Our stope is in the mountain right about here, and we're working our way to the east. This is east towards this big, huge fault structure right here. We're gonna reference this a lot today. This is what we call the north-south trending fault. In the underground workings, there's a raise that runs right up the fault and comes out right underneath that big rock there. So that's the vein we're mining. There's another structure right here you can see the white it comes up under vein number one we're going to talk about we're going to go look at it today we kind of think it rolls into this structure comes across the hill there's a little bit of a vein wisp there and then up it changes the orientation of the vein much more steeply dipping there's two other veins that we're not going to see today but i'll mention them while we're here there's one here that's almost vertically dipping and more north south trending and there's one way up here on top of the mountain. And that's the old one that the old timers worked. It was really, really rich. But what I wanted to mention also, this, all this whole mountain here, this is cliff former, is a phyllite. It's a metamorphosed sedimentary rock. And the theory was this was old seafloor sediments that had some low grade gold in them. They got accreted onto the North American plate. There was some volcanism that happened. All this slope forming stuff over here, this is all an intrusive diorite. So as you had this intrusive diorite come in, hot fluids were circulating through this system, dissolving all the gold out. And then they got later injected back into the, the host rock here. And you have these gold veins come out that we're mining now today. I keep getting raindrops on my camera. So that kind of gives you a little bit more of the local geology of what's going on here. Hey, this is my buddy Dale. Morning guys, up here at uh, Jason's new gold mine, scratching around. Uh, we're gonna do a little arm waving on surface. So I like to spend my free time up here in the cold rain and wind, <laughs> uh, playing with the rocks. So it should be a good day. Yeah, we should hopefully uh, come up with some crazy ideas and you know see where that takes us. Yeah, wanna bring you guys along and on this beautiful summer day here in the Cascades. <laughs> yeah, it's about normal. Yeah, so Tamarack Geological Services, uh, we started out kind of core logging uh, support for exploration companies around uh, Western North America. We, nowadays, we do a lot of geologic modeling, uh, some resource work, uh, geophysical modeling, pretty much all the fancy stuff that people like to see in 3D. Uh, take, a, take a deposit like this, put it in 3D space so that way people can understand a little better what they're doing. Any other exploration support, line cutting, soil sampling, mapping. We do underground work as well. So, you know, we're pretty, we've got a varied skill set and a fired up crew of geos running around the Northwest. Hit us nice. up if you're, if you need a little bit of this on your site and uh, we'll see where it goes. And if you're interested in some more info on Tamarack, I'll leave a link to their website down in the description below. So check them out. They're doing a lot of cool stuff. So we're gonna start today. We're right outside the blacksmith shop portal. And we're going to talk about the host rock for the veins. This is a Jurassic phyllite. So this is kind of what we're dealing with. This is, in some spots, they have a lot of quartz stringers running through them. We would call that sweat quartz. I don't see any right in here. Much on this side. Yeah, there's a little bit. <laughs> and then you got the foliation plane, which is really kind of, we're, we're wondering how important it is with the rest of the system. It's kind of parallel to my hammer and you can see it. You know, it kind of separates these layers in here in this fresh outcrop. And when we get over to the other side, you'll be able to see the quartz veins or the sweat quartz 
is kind of parallel to that foliation plan. Right. And so one of the things we're going to think about today is how that plays with, um, with the rest of the system. And this is the contact between the phyllite here on the right, which is the west, and the diorite or the intrusive on the east. So we're going to take a walk right over here into these bushes, find a nice outcrop of the diorite so you can compare what the fill light looks like, that gray, massive, kind of boring looking stuff to the diorite and the intrusive. We're about two or 300 feet from the blacksmith shop portal now. And I wanted to show you, this is the intrusive right here. So it looks a whole lot different from the fill light. There's light colored grains in there, some dark colored grains. This is a weathered surface, but this was a big body of magma that intruded into the surrounding rock and may be the source for our gold veins. Dude, that is a wicked hammer you got there. Oh yeah, it's your tool. It's, uh, doubles as a walking stick, a digger. It'll cook you breakfast in the morning? Yep, Do it all. <laughs> it's my new favorite. Yeah, so here we're just looking at more of that oxidized intrusive. Um, one of the things, you know, you'd be looking for if you're trying to find more veins or how this is related to our veins is some alteration in this diorite. Um, alteration is a pretty big subject, but uh, right now I'm not really seeing much in here aside from, aside from just some oxidation from the surface. Uh, so that's one of the things we're kind of curious about here is the relationship and the timing between this intrusive and uh, the veins Jason's got going. So about the only place you can find outcrops around here, because that's what most of it looks like, but the only place you can find outcrops is in the stream bed. So this is a pretty good look at that intrusive again. There you go. Yeah, a little yeah. less weathered, huh? Yeah. A little less weathered. Yeah, some of the things you're looking for in here is, uh, you know, if there's any clays around. It could be an indication that we have some a type of hydrothermal alteration around. So just a real quick note here. All this cliff forming stuff here is phyllite. And then right there is the contact and it turns into this kind of slope former. You've got all this talus, it's all phyllite. But then looking around, this is all the intrusive that's much more slope forming. There's no cliffs out there at all. So you can tell just from kind of looking around at the landscape where you might have some different rock types just by their slope forming, cliff forming relationships. I wanted to get you a little wider view before we get up there. We're working our way right up that real steep north-south trending fault. There's that big flat rock I pointed out earlier. What I want to do is get up here and I want to show you the vein, how it cross cuts this fault. And it appears that this fault may be older than the vein system because the vein isn't displaced at all. One of the things we're going to talk a lot about today is what's controlling the grade. Because as a miner, that's what I care about the most. I want to go mine the highest grade stuff. And there's some, there's some evidence that these high angle faults are what's controlling some of the grade in these systems. And the closer that you get to these fault systems, these fault vein intercepts, the higher and the higher grade gets in the veins. All right, so this is a piece of a mafic dike that runs right up the fault. And we'll see this outcrop underground. So when we whack this thing open, you're gonna see the difference from the intrusive that we saw earlier that's much more felsic, has a lot more quartz. And this is quite a bit more mafic, so we, we shouldn't see hardly any quartz in this. It'll be real dark, real black. Oh yeah, yeah there we go. Tool. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> so there's a little weathering rind where it's been laying on the surface and oxidized in. But once you get into the clean break, very, very fine grained. So that tells us that as it was intruded or injected into the system, it cooled very, very fast. The grains didn't have time to grow big. And it's also very mafic. So yeah, you're, you know, this is very different than that diorite yep. over there. And, and it's very, uh, very different than the phyllite. Mm-hmm, yep. And hanging out in this fault that we're standing in here, which is also normal. The, the dikes really like to squeeze into existing faults just because there's some open space there. Exactly. Ready to take it. We've reached the big flat rock. 
I can walk through that hole, so that gives you some scale. That thing's probably 20 to 30 feet tall. And the reason why there's this big slash through the mountain is you have this fault zone that's a weak area in the rock. And as the water starts trickling down the fault, it's a much easier path to a road for the water. Over a long, long time, the water just eats this huge gash through the mountainside and it shows where the weak structure of the fault is. And that's how we can follow these north-south trending structures by the erosional features. The fault raise comes out right up under this big rock. And I wanted to pan over and show you there's quartz running right through there up on the surface. And there's actually two different quartz veins. There's that one and there's another one that's running up higher than this lower one. And they're separated by about six, eight, ten feet of waste. And that's the big question. I've talked a little bit in my past videos about two different generations of quartz. Are we looking at a first generation and a second generation? Are we looking at uh, a kind of a, a split section where you had the vein come into a structure that was maybe a little bit screwed up and you have two different systems that have gotten multiple generations of quartz? That's one of the main questions. The other one is, does one of these have all the goodies, all the gold and the values, and another one is just barren? This is the lower vein. You've got some quartz in here all the way up through this area, a fairly well-defined hanging wall coming down here. And then this is all waste right here, starting about right here, all the way up, and then you get this other little stringer of quartz. And it's hard to tell, but I think this is more or less the foot wall, and it runs all the way up to there. So maybe a two foot wide vein here, maybe a two and a half or three foot wide vein here. And as they work their way up, the side of the hill, they actually start to separate some because one comes here and one starts to go up the hill at a steeper angle. Dale's checking out vein. I'm gonna walk under this big rock and I'll show you right here. It's plugged now, but right here is where the fault rays breaks out onto the surface. We're under this big, huge rock right here. All this stuff is being sheltered by this big rock. But if we broke through here, we could actually access the workings down in the blacksmith haulage way. So this raise comes right up this fault. And actually, is there a vein right there? Looks like there might be some quartz right there so the vein the rays may have followed the vein all the way up and if you look over here dale's work in the vein in the exact same elevation i'm sitting on it the fault rays comes up through and then there's some quartz right there on the hanging wall so the fault does not displace the vein which is very very interesting but may control some of the grade We'll talk about this a little bit more underground, but there's two different characteristics of quartz here. This is a fairly coarse grained. There's some buggy stuff, a little bit bigger, a whole lot rustier. This is what I think might be the first generation, which doesn't carry much gold. And this is a much wider, much more fine grained. And this is what I've been finding a lot of the good gold in underground. And so this is the stuff here that we're gonna be trying to identify in these vein systems on the surface. All right, we're waving our arms about our two generations. Dale's got a theory. Yeah, I mean, I'm just kind of thinking, you know, you have your, your early generation of quartz vein. Um, it's there, it happened however it happened. And then you have this second generation that Jason's found that really carries the grade and you know, I'm, probably, I'm thinking of that as kind of its own independent later thing. Like it happened in a similar time frame, probably, but probably under some slightly different stresses. And so it's kind of cruising around through the 
the original quartz vein, uh, probably because there's a rock strength contrast there between the phyllite and the quartz. And then as the original quartz vein changes orientation, you probably have that, that second generation cross cutting through it for some period of time. Maybe it's in the middle of the main vein, which I think you've seen. Maybe it pops over under the foot wall or back on the hang wall. It's kind of its own independent thing um, after the fact, after this original quartz vein was put in place. And we were just, this came up because we were just talking about one of the other um, veins on this property and how the, the pay zone is on the foot wall. We've got some interesting theories about maybe what's going on there, but they're all pretty big. TBDs. <laughs> a lot of ideas, not a lot of data. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, we're finishing up here. The lower vein doesn't seem to have any goodies in it. The upper vein up here, right up against the hanging wall, appears to have some really good stuff. So that'll be key when we go underground and we talk about where the gold might be. We're taking a look at our two veins on the east side of the fault. Comes under the big rock where the vein's exposed right at the rays. And we've identified a spot over here. Dale's working it. Yeah, that's quartz vein, all right. All right, so we got our vein. It works right up here. It's really hard to see on the surface, but I think this is it right here. It's about eight or 10 inches wide. Works its way right up under these trees. And the other thing this shows is we've got our quartz vein coming down right across the fault and no displacement. So the fault either did not displace hardly any on its initial movement or the quartz vein is younger than the fault and cross cut the fault. We're working our way around the hill now and we're standing at the bottom of this more or less vertical vein that's going up and intersecting our stope. And for those of you who have seen my videos over the past couple of years, this is a spot where I took a round here a couple of years ago. So let's go in and take a look at some of the structure here and how it might interact with the stope above us. But here's the lower section of the blast. I haven't got my excavator up here to muck this out yet, but it's really bellying out here. It's doing a little curve around, maybe coming quite a bit more flat lying. And as soon as it goes up into the vertical position, it pinches, but then above up in here, there's some spots where it's up six feet wide, works its way up the structure here. And our stope is right above those little bushes. This is a real interesting spot. The old timers didn't focus on this vein hardly at all. But I'd really like to understand how this structure and this vein system interacts with the current vein we're working. So this is another section where we have a very well, super well defined hanging wall. And within the vein structure itself, almost another very, very well defined separation between the quartz this generation of quartz and maybe another section of quartz here that came in and intruded into the same structure. And the question again is, what is controlling the grade in these veins? Am I looking in the upper vein, the lower vein? Do both generations have gold? A lot of big questions. So right now we're on the east side of the fault, right? We're on the east side of the fault. Yeah. We've just come in the blacksmith shop. We've just rounded the corner in our first exposure to the vein. Can you point out kind of where the vein is there? It's a little skinny guy. There you go, about eight inches, 10 inches. Works its way up and around. It's a little wider over there and coming down here. The vein continues right there along the wall. They drifted on it all the way out to the surface. But there's no value down here in this vein section. And here in about another 30 feet, we'll show you, just like on the east side of the fault, when we were outside, this is the lower of the two veins. And there's an upper vein just right around the corner where Dale's getting to. And they did quite a bit more work on that vein. So we're looking, can you show us the lower vein? Real hard to tell, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. So you've got, some, you've got some vein right there. That's the lower vein. That's what we walked in on and they drifted in on eventually. And then they got here and they realized that there's actually two veins here separated by waist. So from about Dale's head 
up to about here is all waste. And then that sucker right there, which is about three and a half, four feet wide, is all quartz vein, and that is the upper vein. We saw it outside. That's where I saw the goodies. So what's your takeaway here, Jason? You got, you got the two veins, you got some fillite. Yeah, I, I think this is the same upper vein that we saw on the surface up in the fault. Mm -hmm. We're still on the east side of the fault. I believe the upper vein's carrying the goodies. The lower vein over my right shoulder is pretty much barren. And for some reason, those old guys followed the barren one back to the fault raise. So this would be another target for me in the near future because we're so close to the blacksmith shop. Bring in the drill, clean out this area and get back there and do a couple rounds up. See if I can develop anything up on this this nice wide mineable width vein that hopefully has some gold in it. Yep, and at surface we saw the the good stuff was in the hanging wall of the upper vein. Correct. And you're just looking at the hanging wall of the upper vein here. Yep. And it, it looked positive. It looked good. Yep. Yep. Good looking stuff. Okay. So this is definitely another target for the future. All right, I like it. And actually, when we were putting in this timber wall. I was scaling right up here, found some good looking stuff. Once I got it on the ground, I told Chad and Harry about it and they put it in a bucket for me. I took it home, slobbed it up and it's some really, really hot, juicy stuff. Lots of gold in it. So this upper vein here has some really nice gold and I wanna show you here, this is the drift where the lower vein goes. It takes a little left hand turn there, if you can see, going around the corner. It's separating from the upper vein, which the old guys drifted on here, and we've blocked it off since. But that has a quite a bit different orientation, and they drifted down on this, and there was an old geo in the, in the 80s that came in, took some samples of this vein, and it was running with some gold. They drifted up here on this, this couple of raises we've timbered up, one here, one over above Dale there, you can see the vein. They went up about, I don't know, 60 feet or so and never developed much, but there was something good here. There's also right over here, there's a little wind. We'll go take a look at that. So here's a section and it's hard to tell. Is this the upper vein to here and the lower vein here and they've actually come together in the same structure? If you look over on this wall, then you can see they're separated again. There's one on the lower piece here, waist in the middle, and then vein on the upper piece. So they've come together almost in this section here, right over at the sump. This is a wind and they wind down on it. They followed the vein down. I don't know if we can get a good view of it. These old workings are it's real hard to see, but this is mostly vein here. I think this, the veins have come together. They chased them down. There's some vein stock work looking stuff here, which is probably the structure of the upper vein. But the old guys chose to follow the lower vein, which is right here. Here's a good spot. Lower vein here, very nice, well-defined foot wall, big horse to waist, and then the upper vein there that follows its way down this way into the sump and that's where they wind down. And they chose to follow the lower vein for some reason. And after this part, we're gonna walk all the way to the fault rays, but there's hardly any development work. The vein assays, pretty much nothing for gold. And I'm wondering if you go down here 50 feet and turn left and drill into the wall 20 feet, if you find a really well-defined secondary vein that has all the gold in it. That's the big mystery on this side of the fault. Here's our fault raise. And Is so this the dike? There's the dike. Okay. That's that Mafic dike. Oh yeah. And I think there's a fresh spot on your left that I've scaled some off uh, behind you. Right over here, down low at your hip level. Yeah. And so there's that dike. Pretty rotten. Yeah. 
That's that fine grain stuff. And so we believe that it runs right up the fault here. And this comes out right underneath that big rock. So we're going to pull these boards off, see if we can get up in there and take a look. But right here in this level, oh look, there's some quartz there. Yeah. But we've been following this back for what, over 100 feet from where we last saw quartz vein. We are following structure but didn't see any, any vein. And on this side, there's nothing. So we've taken off the boards, we're looking up the fault rays here, and we're going to take a little climb. I'll show you where the veins are exposed in the fault rays. The bale's coming up. I don't know about 10 feet. Here's the structure of the fault. I'm going to get my finger out of the way. Right here. Yeah, real nice defined structure. And they followed it right up the rays. But what I'm interested in is to find the veins. See if I can climb and film at the same time. <laughs> and so what we have is just up around the corner, boom, we blow up into this nice big wide well-defined quartz vein. And they followed it right up the fault. Nice. Oh yeah. Isn't that sports vein? Yeah, so riddle me this. So on your right hand, there's a pretty well-defined quartz vein right there with the steel sticking out of it. Yeah. And then look behind you, you got all fill like. Yes, you do. And now look, come on up here a little bit farther. And now look over your head. You got a very nice, well-defined quartz vein running right across the fall. Dusts. Yeah, sure enough. So, I haven't been up here in a long time, but here's my new theory. The first generation came in on that on this structure over here. This guy. Yep. Came across. And at the time it came across, this side of the fault was up high. The fault had six feet of movement in it, dropped this down, and the second generation of quartz came in the same structure, cut right across the fault and kept on going. So this is first generation. That's first generation. It's been dropped down six feet. And this is second generation on the left side of the fault, yeah. the, the east side. Right. And this is both generations on the right side. So in the stope, you have one well-defined vein with two generations. This guy. Yeah. Yeah. On the west side. And on the east side, you have two separate quartz veins because the fall offset them by six feet between the intrusions. And we saw this down in the, in the drift that we were just walking in. We saw it down, two yep. Separate veins. And we saw it on the surface on the east side of the vein, or east side of the fault, I mean. Here you can see right there some of those big intrusions, uh, those xenoliths we were talking about. Yeah, all the The wall rock, yep, where yep. it ripped through. Yep. And then the vein moved, or the fault moved, the vein down, and the second generation came through. Oh, across, yeah. Yeah, I like that. I think also you have evidence for that outside because we didn't see any reasonable offset on this structure out in the fault going. Correct. There could be a little bit, but it wasn't, it wasn't significant. It wasn't like, you know, dozens of feet or hundred feet. Right, right. <clears throat> So I think the upper vein on the east side of the fault is the second generation, and in the stope they're mixed. I think that's a pretty good. I think that's a pretty good idea, Jason. So if that's true, then we would expect to see some pretty good, good grades in the hanging wall 
or somewhere through this one. Agreed. Dead here. Dead, dead there. Some good mineralization from the, from the second gen upper band. And does this look like the other courts that you, you know, the type of courts that you typically have identified as being just kind of the dead bull courts first gen? Yes, absolutely. And this stuff up here has the more kind of sugary texture to it. But yeah, this lower vein here, it looks it looks like the stuff I would not be interested in this dope. The xenoliths in there, pieces of wall rock, the bread you see some real nice brecciation going along right along the bottom. Yeah, yeah. And typically that stuff assays nothing, nothing, nothing. Nice. It's really continuous, man, all the way up there. That's it cool. is. And we can follow it all the way up. That the, the vein is continuous all the way to the surface. But look at how brecciated it is yep. in here. It, it entrained a whole bunch of nasty stuff. Yep, yep. All the way up. Definitely. Yeah, it looks like there's more of it kind of down in here, so it's kind of fingering, fingering down through this zone, picking up a lot of waste holes yep. along the way. Yep. We're up here on the stove. Since we took our round, you can kind of get a real good look at what we're looking at. And... I think what we're seeing, I've talked about this on some of the other videos, is you've got two generations of quartz. The upper section here, we'll take a closer look, is more or less barren. It's mostly bull quartz, white quartz. You've got some of these big xenoliths, a fill light in there. Some of the smaller ones have been altered pretty good. And it kind of grades into the hanging wall here. Little veinlets around. And then you have a second generation, which has made a very nice contact with the first generation. Running across, it makes a real nice hanging wall contact right there I want to go look at. But that phyllite is a horse to waste in the middle of the first generation, the second generation. The second generation kind of peters out into the foot wall there. But the second generation, especially in the stope, is much more white in color. Has some really nice pyrotite stringers running through it. And then typically right at the hanging wall contact right there is where we find the really, really juicy stuff. And this is where I've been bringing everybody up, and we've been pulling out grams and grams from a few bags out of this spot right here. It's nice that you have this sulfide pastry coming through that you can follow that really defines the, the second generation. And then as you're moving forward towards that fault raise, um, if, the, if the overall system starts to change orientations with the second gen stays linear, you'll have something nice to follow and it'll be interesting to see how that plays with what we saw in the fault raise with the two separate veins right up by that north trending pole. Yeah, you gotta stick on the second generation. Mm -hmm. Well, and to get everybody oriented here a little bit, if we shoot about 20 feet this way, we intersect the fault raise. Well, no, if we shoot 20 feet this way, we intersect the fault and then I gotta turn and we gotta drift about 30 feet through the fault to intersect the fault rays, and then we can start sending the muck down the fault rays. But how accurate is our mapping? Does the vein start doing weird stuff? Does it drop off as it gets to the fault? Does it pinch? Uh, we're not, that's, that's kind of our best guess. But my strategy is stay in the pay, mine towards the fault, and figure out what happens when you get there. Yeah, the overall vein systems probably gonna change orientation a fair bit. We've seen it all over the site. Hopefully the pay stays reasonably linear. Yeah. Well, in some of the areas of the pillars in the stope, the pillars that they left, you get some really, really nice pay streaks right up against the hanging wall. And so it almost seems like the second generation kind of dipsy doodles through the vein. And in this section, it's kind of more towards the middle, but. On some of those pillars, you get it right up against the hanging wall. Yeah, and it's also dipping roughly 30 degrees over there, right? It's yeah. It's flat here. Yeah. <clears throat> well, and you actually see it here some. 
as this comes across, you know, you're getting real close to the hanging wall here. You're yeah. only about six inches away from the hanging wall. Right. So it's working its way up. It almost looks like the second generation maybe took a, a sweep up here. And this one just came like a laser beam right across. Right. I mean, right. it's only dipping about, what, a few degrees. Yeah. It's pretty flat. Pretty flat. But it just carries on right across there, right back behind Dale. Yeah, and you get a lot of pure tide all the way down through a zone, probably a foot and a half right through here. Yeah. And how's the pure tide? Is the pure tide a good indicator of the gold? I think the pure tide is a really good indicator of the second generation. Mm -hmm. But I think the gold sticks right up against the hanging wall. Right up in here. Yeah. Or right, right at the contact or somewhere like that. We're looking right under here when the second generation comes up and that is really, really nice and smooth. It's very smooth. If you had, so, you know, when you only have one or two chatters, you got to be pretty skeptical about it. But let's say those were, were good chatters and we were pretty confident in it. The way you can work out which way this fault's moved is by moving your hand over the surface and feeling which direction's rough mm -hmm. and which direction's smooth. The direction that's rough, where my hand is on the, what would be the foot wall of this fault, couldn't move that way. So it had to have moved this way. In this case, we don't know because there's only a couple and it's not very convincing, but that's one of the ways you can, you can work out the kinematics. Rough this way, this block, couldn't have moved that way. Mm -hmm. Had to have moved this way. Uh -huh. So then, you know, you could picture at some point when this fault was doing its thing, all of this lower stuff was moving that direction. Yep. And you can work out the direction based on the the lineations and uh, the direction of the of the movement, and then also, um, you know, the chatters the, help with that as well. The chatter marks. So chatters. You, if, you, if you've got some good indicators, you can really dial in the direction and the uh, attitude. Is that the right word? Yeah. The, the yeah, movement attitude. the movement direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that a, a word that describes all of that is just the kinematics. And kinematics yeah. is just how it moves. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it'd be cool to find, find something more convincing, but that's a really good fault select. Yeah. Really good contact. And the interesting thing, we've talked about this, I don't know if I got on a camera earlier, is the idea in a lot of veins is you get this fluid and placed in this, in this situation where it's right against the wall rock. You have a very, very smooth, well-defined contact. And there is absolutely no alteration, no baking, no nothing. I'm actually looking over here. Is there any, is there any sort of like, it's all screwed up obviously, but is there any sort of drag See, that's in the foliation? It, yes. See, I was just, I was just thinking we could point that out because that's another way that you can verify the, the kinematics. Cause we said that this wall, what did we say? This wall couldn't go that way. Uh -huh. It had to go this way, uh -huh. which means that this one's going that way. Right. And so you can see if this block is moving that way. Does that work with those? I don't. I don't. I think the I orientation think, screwed up. I think they would be opposite. Opposite. It almost looks like the top one needs to be going that way. Yeah, it would drag in the foliation. It. But I don't. It's so chaotic here, you can't really tell. Yeah, but the point being that it's that it's um, there's it, it's it's very unusual, I think, to have such a well-defined contact with no alteration or change in the in the host rock i mean it's just it's it's a laser beam contact and you can't even tell i mean if you were just looking at this section of rock you'd never from here up you'd never even know there was a vein half an inch down it's crazy yeah yeah if those <clears throat> those would need to be dragging like this uh-huh according to those chatters those cat chatters could be bs too yeah there you yeah know, there's one yeah yeah. <laughs> so, yeah you know this is probably a better the dragging of the foliation into the um into the faults probably a better indicator of the kinematics sure all right guys well thanks for watching our video hope you enjoyed a couple of geos doing some arm waving underground 
Dale, how'd you like it? Yeah, it was good. You know, it's the third time I've been up here. Uh, every time you learn something new. I think today we, you know, did some heavy arm waving and come up with some good questions. And, you know, at the end of the day, Jason's he's got the gold in the face, and that's what matters. So <laughs> That's right. Now yeah. I've got to make sense of everything we talked about today to find more gold. So, yeah. But, yeah, if you haven't checked out Dale's website, check it out, Tamarack Geology. I'll leave a link below. Thanks again, everybody, for watching. We'll see you in the next video.